hopefully you'll find it reasonably informative. Um, there will be a wee bit of to and fro as we go along. Hopefully it doesn't disrupt the flow um, too much uh, and you will um, uh, hopefully um, get uh, plenty, plenty from the presentation. So what we're going to cover uh, this evening is, I just want to get a little bit of background about the competition review. I think it's important just to set the scene as to where the competition framework comes from, because the, the review was quite an extensive uh, bit of work. So we're going to touch a little bit on there. Then the development of the framework itself, um, what that actually means and how we did it. Um, and then what we see is the next steps. And then you'll see there steps one, two, and three. We have three key steps that we think that we need to be uh, following. So hopefully, again, within that, you'll get enough from that to get a sense of exactly what it is that we're looking to do. And likewise, um, maybe one or two of the conveners may have circulated some slides of uh, previously used, in which case, if you have seen some of these things before, then hopefully we'll be able to bring some of that to life uh, for you. So um, first and foremost, Al, do you want to add a wee bit in just now, just before we get started? Yeah, I think it's probably important at the outset just to establish that this is one of a number of pieces of work that are going on. And uh, as we go through, you, you may have some questions that arise about the implications of this across other parts of the sport. So, and we have a review, in fact, a project to um, revamp our coaching qualifications, which is running in parallel to, uh, to this. And uh, we've made some significant changes to the national programme um, as well. So there's a lot of uh, elements moving forward. Hopefully we'll converge neatly together uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, but this is really important. Whatever the competition programme is, directs significantly what uh, coaching practice looks like, what coaches are doing, what clubs are doing. So um, this doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's very much an integral part of um, the sport and what we see um, as important for the sport moving forward. So that's it for me just now. Thanks, uh, Alan. Um, so the first little bit of context was the competition review uh, itself. Um, Hopefully uh, you've had a wee chance to glance over the, the executive summary, I guess, of the recommendations. Um, the, the review itself uh, did involve the competition review group that set up on behalf of the National Swimming Committee and did include a range of different people and then subsequently the swimming conveners uh, as well. So we did have a broad range of people that were involved with it uh, and it went through a, a fairly um, a fairly serious bit of work that was conducted by uh, Jack Thorpe on behalf of the group, uh, which involved um, surveys going across various groups, including um, parents, coaches, athletes, clubs, districts, for which we received over 500 responses to that. So this is what the recommendations were, were based uh, on, uh, some really thorough evidence that was coming through and some key themes that were coming through. And the, the recommendations here, um, these were the, the main themes that were, were developed from that, from that review. The top one there is the development of the Scottish Swimming Framework, which of course is what we're here to talk about this evening. But you can pretty much see how one sort of knocks on to another. So once we've done the framework, we'll then gradually move through uh, some of the other ones and some of which we can do concurrently um, uh, as, as well. Move on to the next one, Al. So the framework, um, looking to, to develop the athlete uh, competition framework, um, taking into account various different things, including the optimal athlete development framework and the British Swimming uh, Competition Pathway. And you'll hear me talking about some assumptions that we've made. One of the assumptions that we've made is, is look, there's nothing really changing in terms of the British Swimming Competition pathway as well. And that's one thing that's relatively fixed at the moment. But anything underneath that, that allows us to consider um, exactly what it is that we, that we wanted to, to do. And I hope, again, when, you go, when we go through it, you'll get a feel for the things that we're suggesting that we, should, we need to evolve um, over the, the coming months uh, and potentially years as well. Thanks, Al. The uh, competition review 
uh, competition framework group. Um, the National Swimming Committee asked uh, Alan and I and Paul as well to Paul Wilson is to go away and form a group to go and look at the framework and to lead on that piece of work. And we, we pulled together a, a group of coaches to look at it. Our key thing around the coaches was to try and get a good balance between people that are, are tend to be coaching kids right the way through to coaches that are coaching through the age groups, youth swimmers, and then up to the senior end of the sport as well. Not just the performance end of the sport, but, but athletes that are competing um, yes, they want to compete, but they're maybe competing within universities or they're in senior sections of clubs, and maybe their needs are slightly different to um, those athletes that are involved with what we would call the, the standard competition pathway, if you like. So a good blend, but all with a really good experience of a knowledge and understanding of what that pathway uh, might look like as well. And we thought that was a, a, extremely important to help evolve our thinking. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. It's fine, Al. It was absolutely perfect timing. Perfect timing. <clears throat> so, and I'll just to give you a, a bit of a flavour around how we built the, fro the process, so the, the process that we went through to, in other words, to build the, the, the framework, there were some key steps that we took. So, first of all, the group focused around the philosophy and the core principles, establish what it is that you're about at that point, what are the key things that we need to make sure um, that are in place then start to define it down a little bit and start looking at the key areas, then bring a little bit more detail in and start to provide uh, an outline of what it does mean within each section of the framework, start to provide some specific guidance and also an explanation as well. So what we're trying to do here is to give you the explanation um, that goes with the process. So, Alan, if you could allow me to, well, I can share now, can't you? If you stop sharing. Yep, there you go. And if I go to here. That's it. That's it, good. Perfect, perfect. <clears throat> so our quest around the Scottish Swimming Competition Framework, the first thing is, is well, how do, you, how do you actually apply a framework, if you like, what it is, the, the principles behind it as well. So we were looking across the different domains that we would want to apply the framework. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, we've included masters within this presentation. And, and by and large, it's to show that actually we can connect the framework right away from kids um, when they take their first steps of competition, right the way through to the senior end of the sport. Now, when we get to the framework itself, you'll see that masters has been pulled into senior swimming uh, as part of it. So essentially we'll end up with three distinct groups. We'll go for children's uh, competition, age group competition, and then senior competition um, as well. When we wanted to do that, we wanted to go think about it in terms of, right, okay, well, what are the principles and what are the philosophy that we want to to look at. And as we progressed it, we decided, look, we're going to have some core principles, the key things that if you're looking at it from the children's end, right the way up to the senior end, what are the key things that run right the way through each of those domains? And I think in any framework, there are probably those things. So things you can apply to the children's domain just as much as you can apply to the uh, senior domain uh, as well. And we thought that Actually, we get those sorted, then that will help to guide us as to how we pull these things uh, together. So these are some of the key principles that we came up with. Uh, first and foremost, and you'll recognize hopefully that from some of the feedback that you got from the competition review, enjoyment and engagement, that was one of the key things that came out. And we felt that that's one of the main things, the main reasons that people compete is that they want to enjoy it and they want to feel as though they've been engaged all the way through, right from the start, right the way through to their end point, whatever their journey might take them. It needs to be inclusive. So in other words, it doesn't matter which domain you're in or where your journey actually takes you, you need to be included. You need to be able to take on that journey as well. It's not just about the standard competition pathway that takes you right to the top end of the sport, you know, we all know that the sport is not linear that way. It doesn't just happen to, to work out that way. People go off in different directions. And so whatever we put together, it needs to cater for everybody within those within within each of those domains. 
And by and large, when we put things together, there will be replications regardless of which domain that you're actually in. We need to take into account athlete development, so I referred to the optimal athlete development model as well. Athlete development happens at different stages, but we can put some lines in the sand um, as well as we go through. But whatever competition framework we put in place, we need to take that into account. The needs of kids coming through vary as they progress and then they evolve as we go through. Different stages of social need in terms of physical need, in terms of um, their development as racers, as athletes, etc., that sort of thing uh, as well. And then as we pull them all together, planning is one of the key things. It doesn't matter which domain you're in, you must have good planning. We need to plan accordingly. Coach guided, one of the, one of the main things, the main focus is for us is that coaches are in the position where they're in the ones, they're in the area where they can actually help to guide what an actually actually does. And also what influence, they're the key part of the influence as to what competitions uh, people go to and what they need, uh, where they go to compete, et cetera. And we felt that that was a core principle that was applied through each of those domains. So bear that one in, in, in mind as well. Opportunity, doesn't matter where you are, you need to be able to have opportunity to compete. It doesn't matter where you are, you should still have the opportunity to compete. And in communication um, as well, we're mindful of the fact that when we communicate the what's and the how's and the why's, et cetera, we need to be communicating the appropriate messages across each of the different levels as to why we're doing things. Uh, That's what she said, so long. Yeah, that Once we've got all of those core principles put together, you can then start to focus in, in each of the each of the um, the different domains. And we started from the bottom up, effectively. We started at the children's um, domain first, and and this is just for illustrative purposes. When some of the things that came up in the in the review, etc., were you know what's the frequency, the focus, the format, the delivery. How does that apply across? each of the different domains as well. And you can move through each of those uh, domains and I'll come to some of those specifics uh, as we go through as well. I'll just stop that. If you wanna put the presentation back up, Al. No. Here we go. Brilliant, we've got the next slide. Okay, so they were all the, philo the, philosoph the philosophy and the core principles. Hopefully we've been through those um, and you've got a good idea of what we put in there and why we put in those for the philosophy. Anything you want to touch on there, Al? No, I just think these are not, again, isolated, the, the, whether you're uh, looking at a first competition for a young kid, not long into a club or where you're talking about some of our senior athletes, you should be able to look at all of these and see that they, they play a very important part in the competition experience, the competition planning. Uh, and uh, what has either got them to that point or what will lead to um, what's a positive experience for them competitively um, throughout our sport. So these are, if you like, the things that we all should be held, held to in terms of the, 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 the accountability for what we do in terms of our, an inter-club competition or our national championships. Great, thanks, Al. So as we uh, move through, we have some key areas that we need to look at. Um, and so these are all the key areas. So if you think about it, there's the principles, these are all the impact areas that they have in each of these domains. So the planning process um, behind each of the domains, the frequency, the duration, the format and the events that we put in, competition geography, probably didn't touch on that one. We know that, we know that um, people swim all over the country and sometimes that the access for competition isn't quite as consistent as it possibly should be. And what we've got to try and consider is, look, there has to be a level of flexibility, say for the geography of competition across the country. Clearly as we move, if you were to move down a more sort of performance pathway type approach, there is always gonna be that bringing together of athletes. That's just the nature of the sport. But equally other types of competition, they can be quite easily uh, catered for geography uh, on a geographical basis 
uh, as well. And when we put all these things together and we drive an outline, then what happens is we can give a little bit of direction as to what we mean in each of those particular areas. And we'll come to that uh, in just a second. So I'm going to just show you a, a, a spreadsheet that gives us a bit of an outline. I'm going to go into a wee, a wee bit of detail around each of those areas that I've just highlighted. But I wanted to just touch on some of these things before I get started on it. So the way I'm presenting it is it'll be on a spreadsheet. But please don't think of it as straight lines, that there's waves in between these lines. You know, there's movement between a children's domain and an age group domain. There's movement from an age group domain into a senior competition domain as well. Why? Because we know that, say, age groupers, are, some age groupers are well good enough to be swimming in senior competition and the needs of some senior athletes at a certain age may, be, may well be catered for an age group competition. So please think of the lines in between as being wavy. I'm sure we'll get to the artistic version of this in due course, but they are permeable, uh, if you like. So if you are at the top end of the children's one, you may well move into the age group and vice versa uh, as well. There are assumptions that we have made. Um, as I said, I alluded to at the start of the presentation, there are some things that we can't control or the assumptions were made around the British swimming structure um, as well and the filter down impact that that has on our sport as well. We're about where we actually place meets, et cetera, competition windows, all of those sorts of things, they remain in place at the moment. Although there is going to be a, 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 a review of those uh, types of things in the not too distant future as well. And of course, Alan and I um, uh, will have our ear to ground as part of that process uh, as well. Terminology, you'll hear, me, you'll hear me talking about certain things. You might not agree with the terminology that we have in place, but Lynn, um, Alderton and the swimming conveners and the committee, etc. We're starting to try and find a, 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 a terminology. We wanted to find a terminology that we're all comfortable with so we all know what we're talking about because there's so many different strands uh, to this, but it is important that we all understand exactly what we're talking about. We've provided some detail this evening, but when we, when we put some detail up just now, we, we absolutely accept the fact there's a whole stack of other detail that's going to have to be developed uh, thereafter. What we're trying to do is to give you a real good flavour of where we're going with this. And then uh, likewise, we also understand that the presentation of it is quite important as well. So I'm talking about ways we'll need to make sure that we do that. But equally, the key message is that each of the user groups or the customer groups or whatever you want to call it, then it's quite important that when we get to um, when we get to communicate with athletes or clubs in a bigger way, a bigger sense, etc., we need to make sure that our messages are more akin to the needs of, of, of the listener at that point in time. So once again, Al, if you can allow me to share. We'll do that. Are we up? Yeah, you're good. Blended. Working on. Right. Okay. So... You'll see there we've broken it into the three domains going across the competition domains for the children's. We've uh, labelled that as eight years plus, the age group competition at 12 years plus, and the senior competition at 16 years plus. Now, again, bear in mind the waves between them. It's very important that. So there will be crossover around the needs of athletes um, along there. Ali, just I'm not sure if people, what size of screen people are watching on or um, viewing on, you might want to just make that a wee tad bigger down the bottom right and or, or however you, you increase the size on your on your computer. Just anticipating that before somebody puts it in the chat. Let's see if I can, I'm just trying to see if I can get to the bottom of this here. There you go. Hmm. Not sure that's making it any better for you though, is it? Not yet. No. Uh, Zoom. Yeah, I'm just trying to. All right, here we go. Let's try 110, shall we? Yeah. A little better? I think you're better, yeah. yeah. A wee bit more? Yeah, go on. 120. Yeah, yeah, and you can scroll down if you need to. Yeah, that's it. Brilliant. Thanks, Al. Okay. 
No worries, thank you. Um, so if you look at the top box, uh, the top box, what we're trying to say here is like, what is the competition focus for our children's domain, our age group competition and our senior competition? And essentially, if you were looking to go through a process, what we're trying to do is establish competition, develop it through each of the domains and then enhance it as we go um, along. You'll see very much um, some of the key principles in that certain in that section above. But hopefully what you'll get again is a wee bit of a flavor. So if we're talking about the children's competition at the, at the start, what we do know is that's that it's absolutely critical that the first competition experiences for kids need to be really, really positive ones if we're going to hook them into the sport and get them to love the sport as we hope that they would do. So um, inclusive, yeah, we need to, it's not about who's the quickest, it's about getting as many kids involved uh, as possible. Fun, exciting, engaging, the racing part of it is key. We want to start developing that team ethos, skills and development, technical development. They have always been at the, the core of what we're trying to develop in young kids as well. So we need to ref, um, reference that within our competition uh, as well. And you'll see there as well as mixed single gender racing. There's no reason why boys and girls shouldn't be racing against each other at that stage anyways. And then you'll see there about non-technical suits. And Alan talked about the start of the presentation about a number of different bits of work on the go at the moment. And that's one of them. We are looking to take a paper to the board in June um, advocating for the removal of technical suits, not the use of, of jammers, et cetera, with the material, the thicker materials and stuff like that, but the actual, you know, the fancy FINA um, suits that cost, you know, 150, 200, 300 pounds um, as well. Then you move across, but hopefully what you can see as you move across, you'll see a building of what we're talking about there. So what I try and get, as you'll see, is that as you move across, you'll get some things that are introduced, one or two things that might drop out a little bit, or the emphasis might be dialed down. If you were talking about a graphic equalizer, you'd be dialing up in some areas and dialing down on, on others. We might have less process-based meets or educational type meets, but more um, racing type meets. You've got the introduction of licensed uh, competition within that age group section as well we've got things like what we talk about is the line of sight so in other words athletes as they improve need to be able to see what's going on with senior athletes but equally all the things that were in place with some of the stuff for the kids stuff that will be carried on into the, the age group competition and likewise into the senior competition as well where we still have that inclusion part we still need to be able to compete uh, um, we still need to be to cater for all people involved. We just need to keep on enhancing it as well. And of course, as you move into the age group competition, the senior competition, there is a bit more need of that more formalized pathway, if you like, of competition that moves you into district championships, national age groups, Scottish national age groups, British championships, British summer champs, etc. as well. That's that, that kind of um, the, the, the standard pathway, as you would see it uh, uh, from that. You'll also see other things as well, that multi-event approach. We're absolutely, um, we're, we're emphasizing the importance um, of that as well. And as we move down, what types of competition are we talking about? I think our feeling is that um, these competitions here, so you start with the kids, the leagues, the team competition, et cetera, the virtual stuff, and then you'll move through and you'll add to it. You'll then start picking up more on the club meets. You'll see there we talked about tiered meets nationally. And one of the key things for us is if we're going to be inclusive, how do we make sure that all the best of us don't get to go to all the competitions or that coaches sometimes just take their best swimmers plus a few to those meets? What we need to do is make sure that we're almost directing to a point and make sure that we're catering for a whole group of swimmers at that stage if we're being inclusive. And so what we're advocating here is a tiered approach, maybe graded meets at that stage where some of the better swimmers at that stage of their development can't take part in some of the meets as well. They're guaranteed that they're going to get a, a swim. What we're saying there is that that should be operated from a national perspective and filtered down across the districts uh, as well. But we'll still need club meets, as you would anticipate club meets. We might need clubs to be delivering certain types of meets, so we make sure we get that multi-event approach as well. 
district champs there are added in as per normal national team champs, district teams, etc. All of those things that you would have associated anyway. And then you build it across again, still have some leagues, some team competition that goes in there. The Masters events come in, but then you add in all the other ones as well. So the Scottish Long Course, the Short Course Championships, the British Championships, they all start to come in from a senior perspective. And of course, you can go on from that as well the international meets, et cetera, that sort of thing. And I think it's fair to say that as we move into the senior element of it, we are talking about, we're probably going to need to pull that into different strands as well. So there will be a performance, an elite performance section of it, which may well be catered for elsewhere quite a lot of the time, either internationally or domestically from a British point of view, et cetera, that sort of thing. But the main, po the main focus of this point of work, bit of work is around what we can do at this stage. Then as we move on, the frequency, um, the frequency of it, so again, we're providing some guidelines as to when people might want to be competing, how much they might want to be competing at that point in time. And of course, if we use that as our guideline, then what the, I guess the knock-on impact of that is what types, the what type of meets do we want on and when and how many of those meets um, as well. And what are the things that we need to take into account <coughs> when we are considered, when we're considering that. One of the key things in here and the principles is that it needs to be guided by coaches. And you may say, well, hang on a minute, some coaches just do it in a certain way. Well, actually, one of the things that Alan was advocating at the start again was, look, there's a, an element of coach education that needs to be going on with this as well to say, look, this is why we've got the framework in place and this is why we are guiding you to do it in this way as well. But it needs to be individual club decisions, development of kids, what the kids' needs are, where they need the, the needs to move through onto the formalised pathway, if you like, or the needs that actually people just want to compete to race, to enjoy, to have fun, etc., that sort of thing, in a more relaxed atmosphere as well. And then it has the knock-on impact into the competition planning stages as well. One of the main things that we are advocating here is an unlicensed calendar of activity. So if you're doing the children's domain. What we're advocating here is, look, we don't want to be saying that you have to be filling in a hundred bits of paper to actually put on a process meet or a, a local meet with your neighbors in terms of a team competition or a relay competition, et cetera, that sort of thing. We want to make it as simple as possible for people to do that because that's what we're driving at for kids, to be honest with you. We want to have a, a good time. We want to be able, able, able to do that without too much not, um, standard regulation involved in it as well. Now, they're the types of planning that we need to do that. So what we're advocating there is, look, yes, do that. But what we're saying is that we need to put something together that says, look, you can do that, but we want you to tell us that that's what you're doing. And that's the nature of an unlicensed calendar of activity. So we know what's actually going on without you having to fill in different forms, et cetera, uh, as well. You would be limited in terms of blocks of competition, granted, but it is coach guided. So we're saying, here's what the guidance would look like in terms of when we're saying that kids should compete and perhaps when they shouldn't compete as well. It doesn't mean to say nothing's happening. It just means that's what our guidance is as well. And then likewise, as you move through, you'll see across all of the domains that the, uh, the unlicensed calendar of activity continues. So if you want to have a, a virtual meet for senior kids who are not really wanting to get accredited times, et cetera, that sort of thing, what we're saying is fill your boots at that point in time. Do that. There's no reason why you shouldn't do that. Uh, and our job is to say, well, here's the types of virtual meets you could do, et cetera, that sort of thing. And I, when I talked about detail, that's the kind of detail that we would um, over time gradually provide um, as well. Of course, all of this needs to be planned uh, if once we get through to the licensed calendars, we move into the age group section and the senior section, that would be more of a, a calendar planning process based on the needs of the sport. And so you'll find that things flip. The standard way of doing that is maybe a club puts forward, this is what we want to do. What we're almost advocating is the flip round is to say, actually, these are the things that we need delivered and we'll need clubs to help deliver these aspects of competition. So the needs of the athletes in the sport, that's the bit that comes first and then the delivery of the competition that comes afterwards. And I'll come to that as well. 
design of the competition. So again, children's competition at the start. You know, low key, no need for real big disqualifications, but if you're doing your own competitions, you can make up the rules yourself effectively, but it should be an educational thing, 25s, 50s, mixed events, single days. One of the big bits of feedback we had from the review was, look, um, kids don't want to be hanging around for, for a day or two days, etc. Let's get in for short, sharp, enjoyable, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and then as you build on top of that, you can still keep that type of thing going all the way through, but you build on, that's where we bring in our tiered graded meets. Then you build on the duration at that point in time. You can put double sessions in, the kind of things that we're more, more, we're more linked into when we're delivering meets, et cetera. Fully accepted that the way athletes in that age group and senior section, that you know, it's totally fine to do a two day meet uh, for, for those types of athletes as well, especially when we get to that licensed uh, calendar of activity when we need to have accredited times to get into meets, etc., that sort of thing uh, as well. And then um, have you, as you move forward into the uh, senior uh, end of it as, as well, what we're actually saying is, look, you might want to still incorporate some of the meat design that you have with the kids up at the senior end as well, because short and sharp might be absolutely spot on for the needs of senior athletes. Um, also. Likewise then competition delivery, these are just a range of, of groups, organisation people that would actually be delivering these meets and you'll recognise those. And then the geography comes in there as well and I've alluded to that a little bit. Local to start off trying to keep it near to where your club's based etc, that sort of thing. We are um, realising that if you're a, a, a child with a disability that might need a a more national view on it as well. That's the way that maybe SDS work, that sort of stuff. It might have that impact at a, a children's level. But then moving through, you can see the the, the organisations that, that would deliver it. And then likewise in geography, there'll be areas of what we're advocating here that says there's no reason why, you know, some of these things shouldn't be delivered in one of the islands or um, if you're up in the highlands somewhere versus down in the border, some of, there's no reason why you can't do some of these things uh, locally or we can't have multiple delivery of some of these aspects as well. But we need to consider that as part of the planning process as well. Facilities um, are obviously going to be a key part, one of the um, restrictors as much as anything as well. But what we do know is for kids, we probably don't need the big fancy Dan pools for kids. Let's try and get competition going um, in the different uh, types of pools. But spectator access might be quite important for children at that point in time. And so taking into that consideration where possible, that might be a really important thing to do as well. Now you build across as well. We do know that when we get start moving onwards and we need to get accredited times and we need to have the facilities to bring more people together because we're having um, swimmers based on their abilities coming together. We're going to have to start using the, the bigger and better facilities, I guess, long course facilities. Um, maybe that will come in a little bit later into the age group section, as well as we establish more of a short course and long course season for athletes. That's the needs that we would see using these facilities where we do start to get a bit challenged at times, but equally, I totally accept that if we're talking about capacity, some of these venues have the capacity that we need. And we just need to be cognizant of these things when we're pulling them together. And then again, as you move through to the senior things, it might revert back to some of the things I was saying in the children's one. It, it might be okay to use a four lane 25 meter pool for senior athletes to race against each other. Universities do that on a fairly regular basis already. And so we would advocate that as well. And then the final bit um, of one of the key areas is the regulation part. So again, I alluded to it as an unlicensed calendar of activity that runs all the way through. Um, however, once we start doing the licensed activity that needs for accredited times, et cetera, we need to have that licensed calendar of events that delivers the type of competition and for the range of athletes that we're looking for um, as well. So if you were just looking at it on a, a kind of low to high, be low regulation from kids to a, a medium high for uh, age groups and then a medium, a low medium and high for the senior athletes at that point uh, as well, depending on what it is um, that you're doing as well. 
So hopefully that gives you a wee bit of a flavor for that part of it. And, and what we could do is we could distill some of that down. And what I want to just show you is just a little bit around planning what that might look like. So if we were taking it for a children's, this is some of the guidance that we might be giving to a framework was, so if you were looking at a kid coming in after being on holiday for a bit, you get in, what we'd be advocating is, look, you, you get in train at that point in time, you reacquaint yourself with the water, you do all those sorts of things that you would normally do at that stage. And then maybe you would compete in October and November, a little bit less so in December at that stage. Why? Because people are doing things at Christmas. That's right. we need to try to take that into account, maybe focusing on their training a little bit more. And then moving across, what I'm trying to say is that this is the guidance that we would put uh, together. Then the frequency just highlights that it might be through October and November that kids are competing weekly basis at that point. Yes, driven by the coach. But remember what we're advocating, say, for kids is it's not the licensed competition that we're talking about. We're talking about unlicensed competition, which is process meets, relay meets. There's nothing to say that people can't compete in the nature of those types of things at that point, low regulated meets, that's what we'd be advocating. Uh, um, advocating. And then as you move through into the age groups, you'll see more of a traditional type approach, but you'll also see that what we're trying to say there, Luke, is that the lot, a, a bit of a short course focus and a long course focus, the long course focus would actually start at the age groups rather than ending at the age groups. And from a coaching point of view, that's quite important because what we're saying is actually, you know, that's the starting point, and we want you to get, we want you to get better at swimming long course through the season because that's more likely what's going to happen to you as a, a senior swimmer. Again, it doesn't stop all the other stuff happening short course, anyways. But that's the advocation, as we, if you like, in terms of how we might do things. And then you see the yellow bits there as well. That's where we're planning the types of meets. And then you move through. And remember, I was talking about a couple of tiers and senior. So we're actually talking about elite performance and senior senior swimming takes in so many different things and so many different kids it's not just about the performance end of the sport the elite performance so you'll see there differences in what we'd be saying and the guidance that we would be giving to the uh, uh, planning of meets at that point and then what we've tried to do also is to hook in open water at this stage as well now that's not absolute we've still got to go to the open water committee and consult etc but in essence, the principle here is, look, how do we engage open water a little bit more in the formalization of a licensed calendar or an unlicensed calendar, if you like, so it makes sure that it fits in, that we get more kids doing open water swimming. And that's what we've seen, I suppose, through lockdown is more kids doing open water swimming. So how do we get more kids involved um, with that as well? So. Hopefully what you've had there is a bit of an idea of the, the bits of detail that we're talking about in there and what we think should be guiding us as we move forward over the next few steps as well. Okay, Al? Stop sharing and we're moving on again. Stop for breath. There we go. Thank you. You want to just move us on? So, what does that mean for the next few steps? So, uh, a wee, what we're going to look at now is just, well, what does that mean in step one, which we've classed as May to July, step two from September to December, and step three, which we think is the sort of the main implementation of the framework, so from January 2022. Again, we're not saying, look, we might not have absolutely everything hitting us all at one time in January 22. There might be some things that need to be rolled in over an, an implementation period, but there are some key things that we'd like to have in place in January 2022, including the planning process um, for the calendar of license meets at that point in time as well. So that would be the end point and the starting of the new calendar planning process, January 2022. Clearly, we're in the situation we are at the moment, which is coming out of a lockdown, moving through the different protection levels in a good way, and that obviously is going to have an impact on what we do in the coming months um, as well. And part of our thinking is around that also. Do you want to move on to the next one, Al? Yep. So this is what we're thinking is, so from May to July, um, the competition return tables that we've already publicised and you've probably had a great look at 
So really good resource that identifies what would happen in each one of those protection levels. So from May, from now, T and Comla are coming in and we know that that's been rolled out as well. In June, as we move through the protection levels again, intern into club meets um, can be put in place there. So you can, if you're in the same uh, facility, for instance, you can race against other clubs. You could do that as part of your team. Come on, you can do what you want from that perspective as long as it sits within the guidelines, the competition guidelines that have been produced. And then we're moving towards a festival of swimming, uh, July the 16th to the 18th, where uh, predominantly around age group swimming and um, getting as many of our age group swimmers, uh, 13 plus, um, engaged in racing at that point, and that would be a licensed competition opportunity. And if you've been looking at some of the um, the 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 publication, etc., that sort of thing, that's when we're hooping, hooking up with the rest of the British swimming in the home countries as well, and we're hooking all of that together. Um, as best as possible at that stage. Really think that would be a, a positive end point, if you like, for the season, but also a positive starting point for the sport as we start moving forwards uh, into step two at that stage. So this is where maybe there's a, a lot of interest as well. Okay, what we're we gonna do from September to December. And when Alan and I were putting this together uh, and having a look at it in the first instance, again, it's been to the Swimming Committee and there's, again, broad agreement, this is what we should be doing. But the principles that we put together are is that we should be using the competition framework to guide and help the transition. So in other words, let's use that September to December period as a transition from where we are now into the new place that we want to be, a, a massive opportunity to change what we've done in the past. We need to look to engage as many athletes as possible. So we're looking at more of a bottom up approach. So if you think about it in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the license type meets, if you like, we want to get as many, um, uh, as many kids as possible involved in those license meets. Cause what we're, we'll get to some of the detail in a second around that as well. Um, we make an assumption that if you're a performance athlete or an elite, an elite athlete, you'll be catered for over and above that uh, as well. We need to work within the Scottish Government guidelines in place and in line with the competition guidelines uh, guidance that we've produced. And then what we're trying to have here is a, consistent, a, a consistency through a more prescriptive approach to sort of planning of licensed competition during this, comp this, this period as well. So rather than just having whatever going on, we think we should be a little bit more prescriptive, especially as we move from one era to another and to help guide us through this situation that we're in at the moment uh, as well. Can we move the next one, please? Yeah, sorry, I'm just feel, I'm looking at the questions that are coming in. We're going to be here till 11 p.m. answering all of these. So <laughs> all right, okay, well, we'll do it. We finished uh, the wine cellar by then. <laughs> so, what we're advocating here is, is September, December, the children's domain primarily, but of course, as I've said before, is non-accredited times uh, approach that can run through the other domains as well. But for the children's, we don't have a non-accredited times approach up to the age of uh, circa 11 years old. There would be an unlicensed calendar of activity, so we would start to establish that calendar of activity because of... Uh, it's a really good opportunity for us to get that in place before we start in January with the, I guess, the new way of doing things. We can advocate for inter and intra club com uh, competition for this domain as well. That process meets and virtual meets they would all continue to take place, and that would be the main focus of that children's uh, children's domain. Okay. Okay. And then in, as we move into the age and senior domain, is that that uh, unlicensed calendar of activity, that would continue. So if you're doing anything in those domains that doesn't require uh, you to have a license, then actually, no, we still want you to put it on that calendar. What we're saying here is, look, based on our planning, what we're saying is there would be no accredited opportunities in September. That's our prescriptive approach coming through here. 
that we would go for age banded meets from October to December. So for instance, in each of those months, you would have an 11 to 13 competition, a 14 and 15 competition and a 16 plus competition. And that way we try to keep the inclusion part going as best as possible to so get as many kids involved as possible. There would be one of those licensed competitions opportunity per month per age group. And that would be run through, per, it would be in per district as well. So it's not just one central one, they would be run across each of the districts. The events that would be covered would be 100s, 200s and 400s. And we would try to run a separate distance competition covering all the age bands, because we recognise that not everybody's going to want to run or swim distance events just now, but we think it's really important that we advocate distance uh, events as well. The calendar planning process would be through each of the district for licensed competition. So your district would plan in those competitions effectively. The meat delivery could vary. So in other words, you could do it through your district. So an example could be that the, the East District may say, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to run those meets across our district. No problem. As long as all those, um, those tiers are catered for, the 11 to 13, 14, 15, 16 plus in the month, across those events, that would be fine. But equally, it could be run by a club and overseen by the district at that point. So the district makes sure that these things are covered, but it may well be run by a, by a club uh, instead. And then as we progress through that, that the short course championships would be held in December um, with a possible age group element that goes with that uh, as well. Now that's just one part of it. There is something else that we want to put in there uh, as well, but I wanted to put that one up front. And then we may as well just go to the next one as well before we start answering some of the questions. The, one of the big bits of feedback that we had was around team competition. So what we are suggesting is here, we have a team competition with three initial rounds of competition to decide or determine leagues for a finals for every team. So regardless of which league you're in, you would still have a finals competition. We'd use the current virtual team champs format as a starting point in terms of how we would do it. The first round we are suggesting would be held virtually at the end of June, so we kickstart it and get the ball rolling. That rounds two and three would be held October, November locally, maybe with the support of the, of the district. We may decide to still do them virtually at that stage as well, but that's still up for discussion. But what we're really looking for is a team league finals to be held the week after the, after the short course. So you know what it's like. People might be focusing on the short course, but equally they're moving into Christmas. There's a feel good factor at that point. And I think if we can end a pretty tough year with clubs, if we can, in one location, maybe on different sessions, but actually coming together to race against each other, because you're in a certain league and you get some pretty good quality team competition where we can get some, some great racing on the go and kids can really enjoy it and, and we can get that really good bit of momentum as we move into January, then we think that would be a great way to finish the year at that point um, as well. So I draw breath at that point. I, I appreciate there's a lot of information that we've uh, provided there. Mm -hmm.